Hey, Martha, I wonder if you fancy playing a little song while we're waiting. I had just the same thought. <laughs> the street and we're treading on all of the flowers and if I was a brave and me I'd go traveling and dream about it every night it's unraveling space I need some space green space send me Space. Oh, and every one of us knows this. Where is the load that we carry around on our backs? But just where is everybody rushing to? Off to the shops to buy all the crap that we lack. Well, if I was a brave and me, I'd go traveling. Oh, I dream about it every night, it's unraveling. Space, green space. I need space. Just some big green space. And we all have a project, growing plan or invention, keep a book for dreaming, escape their daily. And we all have a project, growing plan or invention, keep a book for dreaming, escape their daily. Daily, daily, we must get to the green daily. Would you like, should I do a little bit more? You're so kind. Um, but I think what I'd like to say first off is to everybody that we're going to be going live on YouTube very shortly. And we've updated the front of the website um, so that very soon we'll be able to put it out through the beginning of the, uh, through the, through the front of the website. And, um, and Martha, yes, I'd really love maybe the one that we were going to use in, as an encore, if that would be OK. The other one, yeah. One minute or now? One minute, yeah. Okay. Does um so does the YouTube does the um Facebook know that we're going to start in one minute? Dana, can you tell the Facebook? <coughs> and um and I'll put it up on the homepage. Yeah. Just um, Claire, if you could call Dana, just say look, we're going to go through YouTube. Facebook's playing games, it's messing around a lot, it's quite difficult, so we're just going to do a YouTube stream, so if she could plug that on the Facebook group and share it a few times, that would be great. We're, we're live now. Well, that's exciting. Um, apparently we're live now. Um, after a few moments of not being live, and in which case I think um, I, would, I would love to introduce, and I'd also love to make sure that we're live on the home page. So um, I'm going to say, Martha, would you mind singing that song? Sure. Yeah. <coughs> 
Breathe in and breathe out. Close your eyes and just breathe. I go to a stream in my mind, a clear flowing stream. It winds through the trees, all mossy and green. We are but a moment in all that they've seen. Summer will come again, and with it memories of happier times. We must gather them in. But don't forget to leave room for new ones to begin. Maybe what they say is true, we're only send the challenges we can grow through. Oh, contemplation. Connected isolation. We're all one nation now. Breathe in and breathe out. Close your eyes and breathe. I go to a stream in my mind, clear flowing stream. When it winds through the trees, all mossy and green, we are but a moment in all that they've seen. Nature, I see you again like before. I took you for granted, but I won't do that anymore. No, I won't do that anymore. The birds are singing like never before. Nature, I took you for granted, but I won't do that anymore. No, 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 no. I won't do that anymore. Thank you so much, Martha. So we've been having some faff with the YouTube live stream. We have got a link that does work um, when you put it directly into YouTube, but for some reason we're having a problem with it from the front of our website. Um, so we're going to need to, um, I'm going to need to just adapt the text on the front of the website so that it says, so you can now watch me edit it on, um, go to, uh, uh, so we can attempt to make it so that everybody knows how to get on to uh, the YouTube. Um, obviously editing documents while you're speaking on a live stream is not the idea. So, um, I'm going to do my best to do that. And I think I'm going to have to continue now and um, look for support and backup from the lovely teams um, to let people know in multiple different fronts. There's quite a lot of um, different options that are coming through. Michael, do you want to just let me know what's happening? Yeah, I do. We're live now on Facebook. There's an audience there. Facebook. Unfortunately, the Facebook feed has fallen over and it's not working. We're unable to do both right now. So we are live on YouTube. Okay. So then anybody, um, so we need to then support um, those other channels to know how to go to 
uh, face uh, to uh, to YouTube, and also put out um, uh, on the homepage uh, of the website. And I'll have a look at that in a okay. moment. Um, okay, so the street conference YouTube channel. It's the live video at the top of the page. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to carry on for a bit, and then I'll stop and check in. Um, so. My name is Susie Martineau, uh, formerly Susie Steer, and I'm the founder of the Tree Conference. That's a one-day conference that has been running for four years now. Uh, normally we have a full day event, and today we would have been having a day in Cambridge um, at the Babbage Lecture Theatre. But in light of all of the crazy changes that have been happening, instead we're doing a one-hour, though possibly slightly longer now, um, broadcast online, and we will... Um, be uh, instead of focusing on a full days of, of science and news and practical projects, we're going to be speaking to Glenny Kindred, um, Merlin Sheldrake, and John Tucker from the Woodland Trust, and we'll also be taking your questions in YouTube. So, um, whichever format you're watching this in, if you could now go into YouTube, we can take your questions in the chat at the bottom of YouTube. Um, and you might need an account for that. So if you don't already have an account, you could always sign up for one. And that means that you can give us your questions. Um, so when in thinking about what to do for the tree conference, it felt like the most important thing was to support people at home uh, with the huge amounts of change that we're all experiencing, the kind of loss of identity from seeing people, the desire to be contributing towards the global environment as, and, and the global tree population as well as also this much deeper connection with trees that we've been experiencing as a result of everything that's happened. So today, thanks to Angelfish Films and also the whole team of lovely people like Positive TV that are coming in to support this live stream, as well as all of the different partners, which we can see from the Tree Conference website at www.thetreeconference.com um, and on the Our Partners page. Um, we're going to be asking some questions and I'm going to go first over to um, Glenny Kindred because Glenny Kindred is joining us um, and uh, Daniel or I think I might be able to hear you. <laughs> um, so Glenny Kindred is joining us and um, Glenny would you like to do you feel ready to unmute yourself? Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Glenny. Hello. How are you? <laughs> hi, hi, Susie. Um, a, li a little bit longer to kind of contemplate on the, <laughs> on the process of life and everything then. <laughs> Let me just also put you in the middle, which I can't do. Nice. So we could be talking people through how to use Zoom, couldn't we? Because such a sort of <laughs> yes. new thing for everyone. I've been becoming a complete Zoom nerd. Um, so, um, well, don't worry about that for the moment. Okay. You can always look at the tree behind the computer. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, okay. If you're looking into the distance, we can just trust that um, that you're contemplating higher things. Okay. Oh well, I mean, it's nice that we're talking about grounding. It's very small. Yeah. Um, because when it is that everything feels a bit weird and changey as it has been for so many of us and 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 it's been so hard uh, in so many ways um then being able to root and being able to support yourself emotionally from remembering what's important uh does really help and how are you finding what what are you experiencing at the moment with regards to all these changes what, what are you noticing in your work well i i'm quite enjoying it really it's giving me time to be, and I think it's true for a lot of people. A, a lot of people have have more time now to to look and be and um, find out what's really important in their lives and what they really value. Nature and people, I think, are the, are the two big ones that come up every time. Yeah, I think I think for me too. And I'm noticing also that there's sort of like some key themes coming through with that. Um, 
So when we think about um, the kind of global situation and the local situation, um, what, how, how, how is it informing your relationship with the sort of sense of a global relationship with trees and our local relationship with trees? How, how do you mean? How is it informing? How's what informing? For you personally, now that we're having this sort of sense of um, what's going on and, and sense of what's important, what's your um, relationship now to, to, to what we need to be doing around trees globally and, um, and also locally at home? We need to be planting more and more trees to start um, and we need to be out there really. I, I just think our relationship with trees is undergoing a massive shift at the moment. Our, our relationship with nature is undergoing a, a massive shift. And it means that the old way of looking at the world and looking at, at trees and nature is changing. And we're, we're, we're already in that change. That change is already happening. And we're seeing ourselves not as separate from nature, but seeing ourselves as part of nature and part of the, of the great interconnection of all of nature. And we're seeing the great interconnection of nature. And um, it's a time of great remembering, isn't it? As you said the other day, this is the time of great remembering. And we're remembering now how important it is that we are connected to nature. And we, are, we feel ourselves to be part of it because we are part of it. And the health of the planet and the health of ourselves is, is deeply interconnected. And, and we know that now. Whereas even 10 years ago, there were just people like me talking about it. And people have just been gradually coming on, coming on towards that understanding. And there's been a massive shift. So you're talking, and I realised, but I didn't really properly introduce you, but you've been, you've written some 12 books on working with trees and cycles, uh, with which we featured on the website, but also is on your website, glennykindred.co.uk, is that? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And so um, my experience from you is the book that you've wrote, written with um, uh, wooden books. Um, but there's more, much more recently, there's the Walking with Trees. Walking. And there's the Earth, path, path, Earth Pathways Diaries, which are a really extraordinary resource. So you've been talking about the way of working with trees for a long time. Um, what is your personal practice around what that means for you and your mental health on a daily basis? On a daily basis, I have to be out in nature at some at some level. Um, I have a personal daily practice, which um, I, I I I like to share, uh, which has grown out of the lockdown time, um, when I've not necessarily been so out there, out in my car, going to the woods. This is what I can't I can't do. I can't go to the woods. So I can walk up the road and get into the fields, but I can't. Um, I can't. I can't enter the woods that I love and um, be there. So um, I've started this daily practice of just. Um, um, so beginning with um, s seeing myself as a tree, and um, seeing myself as whatever tree pops into my head at that moment. So, you know, I might one day be a mighty oak and be feeling good and strong, and I might one day be a twisted little hawthorn by a brook. It, it, it makes no difference. This is the tree that's popped into my head. So I be with that tree, my tree self, and um, I observe. And it might be I observe a landscape that unfolds. So I'm much more in my imagination since the lockdown. And, uh, and then I send my energy down into my roots. I focus on that interface. I love that interface where the, the, the outer tree becomes where the roots go down into the earth. And I find that such an exciting little interface. And um, when I'm with trees, I'm always there around that interface. You know, sometimes you get little holes, don't you, that go down. And, um, sometimes the trees are more, the, the roots are more vid visible, they're all on the surface. Sometimes the, 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 
you don't really see where the roots go down. But in, in my personal practice, that's what I do. Focus on, the, on the, my roots going down. And as my roots go down, I focus on that anchoring to the earth and what it feels like to be a tree totally anchored to the earth, not running around like we do, but anchored to one spot, sometimes for hundreds and hundreds of years. You know, there's some amazing hawthorns near my house. They must be 600 years old. They're completely wizened and bent and, ah, oh, incredible beings. Um, so it's it's about feeling feeling how it feels to be anchored to the earth and and to be part of the earth. And, and I think this shift, that's a shift that I make for myself every morning. And it helps me to, to see what rises because there's a stilling in that, in an anchoring, there's stilling. And then I can see what rises, what rises into my being, not with my head, but with my roots in the earth. And, and I found that hugely, and, and giving thanks, I do that every day as well. I just give thanks from that place of being rooted in this earth, part of this earth. Mm. I forgot what the question is now, but so I think you've answered it beautifully, and also it really sort of it, it really highlights the the difference between the um, the what a, a tree needs to root. Um, and in past videos in the tree conference, which you can see on the website and on the YouTube channel. We've got um, the work of Martin Bidantontoro, who's explaining how um, the effect of excess nitrogens really affects soil health uh, and the mycelial networks. And therefore, the tree is unable to um, root so well in the sense that it cannot take, receive nourishment so well because the mycelial networks are destroyed. Um, or we've got Isabella Tree showing about uh, wilding and how you can be planting trees in such a way as you're not actually physically planting them, nature's planting them themselves and therefore able to establish much better root structures. And also um, Dr. Alan Rayner, who uh, came to the first tree conference and did an amazing job of helping us to see from the perspective of the, um, the fungi more and understand what they teach us about, uh, about, the real about reality. Um, and we will go on to talk to Merlin Sheldrake in a moment, who's going to give us uh, a, an amazing way of being able to understand that from the roots perspective. But what you've really helped us to do is anchor in to the, the benefit for us as humans to uh, be relating to trees for our mental well-being uh, on a daily basis in order to feel sourced and replenished in such a way as we can handle the rough weathers of change. That are happening at the moment so I'm really grateful and I'm conscious that when we spoke before we were talking about what does that mean that we can learn from how trees work and um, one of the things we were, we were talking a little bit about community and adaptability and I wondered if you wanted to say something about that. Mm. Well trees have been here a very long time a lot a lot longer than we have and we're just a little the little brothers and sisters really and trees have adapted time and time and time again to climate changes and uh, conditions, their living conditions. And I think, you know, we are at a point of adapting. And as humans, I think we're very good at adapting. So that gives me great hope for the future. The other thing we can learn from trees is living in community. And I think that's another lesson that everybody is starting to realize how important their communities are. And uh, trees live in community, they help each other. You know, I, I was brought up to believe that everything, everything was in competition with each other. And of course, all of that's been blown open now. And we know that trees live in community. We know that trees help each other. And that is the way forward for humans as well. So if we can adapt into, into that, cooperating, um, finding, our, finding our connectedness with all of life. That's our way forward because that's what trees do. They and I love the feeling that, that a lot of that's coming down through the roots, the feeling that you're rooting down and you're from within the earth, you're connecting to your community. Mm. Mm. And um, I would, I, before we move on to speak to Merlin, I would love it if you could give us some examples of practical different tree species 
that are ones that you would be connecting to particularly at this time of year um, and also ones that maybe relate on a medicinal basis or yeah so some practical examples from your books because I, I really think there's no way we can do justice to the amount of knowledge that you have gained in working with trees over the time that you have but I really would love people to know that they can go to your books and that they can um, and go to the website and go to your um, Earth Pathways diaries for understandings about the cycles. So yeah, would you like to talk about some specific trees? Well, I'd like to say that whatever I say is not it because it's all down to your relationship with the trees. So really spend time with trees and go out and sit with trees and, and walk with the trees with, a, with a, an awareness of the trees beside you and an awareness of trees in your life and what they give to us on an everyday, everyday basis. Um, but at this time of year, up here in Derbyshire, um, the beech leaves are unfolding and I absolutely adore the beech. I adore all the trees, but the beech leaves, when they come into leaf, they are so perfect and they're so fine. They're like skin. They're like fine skin. And um, I, I eat them. <laughs> I, I collect them. I talk to the trees and I collect the, their leaves. And um, at the moment, I'm a bit short of salad stuff with the, with the lockdown. And so I've been eating a lot of tree leaves. Um, so beech, beech leaves are absolutely, it lasts for two weeks, maybe. Um, I haven't got any gin. I might make some gin, the beech leaf gin, if I had some, but I haven't this year. Um, uh, hawthorn leaves, absolutely prime for our circulation, for our hearts, uh, for older people, because it, it increases circulation to the brain. It's very, very good for us to, to eat um, or make tea from um, hawthorn leaves good to collect this time of the year while they're really fresh just before they come into flower. It's perfect time. So I've been collecting those and I've been collecting birch, birch leaves, also incredibly good. They're, 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 they're a great tonic. They clear out the old, they, they, they clear out our systems of any, any nasties that might be stuck in there. So they're really good too. Um, uh, so I've been collecting those. And the other thing, is the elderflowers. Now I imagine down in, south, in the south of the country, the elderflowers are just coming through. Not the... quite, not where I am, not quite, but I really kind of get, I'm like, come on guys, come on. <laughs> and, and those two are, are hugely beneficial for us. Stress and anxiety. I've just had a little cup of elderflower tea before I started. The very last of my collected dried elderflowers from last year, but the new are almost here, so I'll collect some more. But collecting from, from nature, collecting from the trees, it creates a bond, it creates a relationship. Um, it, 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 it creates, um, you, you know, you, 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 do, you get to know the trees. It's not, the trees aren't something over there. There's something that your heart, you give your heart to them. And, and you've also named a lot of the smaller trees. So often people think about the really big trees and oh, they're the really fun ones. But actually those, um, those more scrubby, bushy, yeah. uh, smaller trees got yeah. a lot to give in terms of fruits, nuts, and, and obviously elderberry, which I thoroughly recommend for a winter tonic. Yeah. Um, as having antiviral properties, which is yeah. relevant, though I'm not suggesting that that's a cure for COVID. Yeah. Well, I, thank you so much. Roaming, roaming the hedgerows is, if you've got hedgerows to roam, and roaming, rambling, take going wherever your 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 heart is pulled, um, is is a great tonic for for this time. And for listening to yourself and listening to the earth. Yeah. Thank you so much, Glenny. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so Glenny will stay with us for the rest of the call and there, if anybody has questions that they want to put in the YouTube chat or in Facebook, then we can um, ask those to Glenny in a bit. Um, thank you very much. Um, I really recommend people get by Glenny's books. They are an excellent, excellent resource. Um, and I would love now if it was possible to speak to Merlin Sheldrake. Merlin and Glenny, would you mind muting yourself now?
Merlin? Hello, yes. Hello, Merlin. Oh, look, Hello. Um, we don't need to have the video just yet. Thank you so much, Dobby. Thank you. Um, Merlin, hi. <laughs> hi, Susie. Thanks for having me. You've been waiting there for ages. <laughs> Um, thank you as well, and I'm particularly keen to speak to you, not least because of our topic of routing today, and that you've got some really amazing stuff to talk about, but also because you've got this amazing book coming out. What is the name of the book? It's called Entangled Life, How Fungi Make Our World, Change Our Minds and Shape Our Futures. And when is it coming out in the US? It's coming out in the US on May the 12th, and it was going to come out in England on May the 7th, but it's been postponed. Um, until September the 3rd, which actually might be a more appropriate time to release a book on fungi. Yeah, yeah. Um, I really, I've been very fortunate to have the chance to have a pre-read of Merlin's book. It's mind-blowing. Um, and I think some of the things that he's likely to say in the next few, few moments might give some insight as to why I would so thoroughly recommend pre-ordering a copy. I think it's a must-read. Um, so I'm going to just dive right in, in terms of what does, what do you think is the relationship between roots and fungi? Well, it's a very, very old one. It's a good question. And, um, and we have to go back several hundred million years. And around 500 to 600 million years ago, when most of life was in the sea, land was scorched and barren, and desolate, windswept, um, really not a great place to be alive. But in the sea, life was thriving. Um, corals were forming, mollusks were thriving, sea scorpions were ranging the bottom of the ocean floor, um, nine foot long. You know, this is, the life is booming in the sea, but really not on land. And, and the big development, the huge breakthrough in biological possibility, uh, a transformational moment in the history of life was when the ancestors of plants, algae, moved out of fresh water and onto the land and became what we now call plants. So this moment is a pivotal moment. And, and when we're trying to work out how and why this happened, um, we come to fungi and we come to roots. And the idea is, is quite simple. When these algae, which had been used to getting their nutrients from the water, and they didn't have roots, they had little puddles of photosynthetic tissue and they washed up onto these shores and they can eat light and air, but they're hopeless at scavenging for nutrients and water from the ground, from, from these young soils. And so fungi were already on land and fungi can't eat light and carbon dioxide from the air, but they're very good at scavenging from the soil. I think they live their lives as these ranging ramifying networks called mycelium. So an early alliance, a very natural alliance struck up between these ancestors plants and these fungi and and the fungi supplied the algae with nutrients and water. The algae supplied the fungi with fixed carbon in the form of sugars and lipids. And this relationship is the root of all subsequent life on land, recognizable life on land at least, and became what we now call mycorrhizal relationships. Mycorrhizal from myco, the Greek for fungus, and rhizo from sort of root. And so for the first 50 million years or so of, of early plants life on land, they didn't have roots. These fungi were their roots. So roots followed fungi into being. And these fungi are more a fundamental part of planthood than leaves, wood, fruit, um, and of course roots. So these, these fungi came before roots. And, um, and so I think of roots as, as a kind of playing catch up with these fungi. They, the plants evolved these organs that looked a bit like fungi, that were long, thin, tip growing, branching, curious. Um, and so, um, so yeah, so, so that's a kind of origin story. So roots really derive in some way from fungi. It's so helpful because for ages, every time you want to start talking about trees and when obviously I am obsessed about trees and want to find out more about them and to understand every time it's always been that we've needed to go into understanding the root system or go into understanding the soil to, to really get a strong picture of what's going on for them. So, so what are the, what are they pass, what are they passing between, what are individual fungi doing for each other? Well, so the individual, so individual fungi and an individual plant will be in this exchange relationship, which is you have a fixed carbon coming from plants to the fungi and you have nutrients and um, mainly nutrients 
coming from the fungi to the plant, but you also have water um, coming from the fungus to the plant. And you also have all sorts of other things that happen. The fungus defends the plant from disease. It um, enables it to defend itself better from herbivores. There are all sorts of um, additional benefits. But this relationship is incredibly intimate. And these fungi are growing um, either around roots or inside the plant cells. And um, it's about as intimate as it gets. And this is where this video that I'd like to show comes in, where I, I got this by scanning roots that I collected in the tropical forest in Panama, where I was working. And by scanning these roots with lasers, I could reconstruct a three-dimensional scan of the root with the fungus in one color and the plant in another color. And so this video gives us an opportunity to actually travel inside a root, which is something I've always wanted to do and I've only been able to do in my dreams. Um, but so I, yeah, so this, this provides this rare access and I'm thrilled that I spent the last few weeks really diving around in these rootscapes. And so there's one that we can see today and I'd like to show that now if we can. So the plant is in blue here and the fungus is in red. And you can see these, the fungus, this type of fungus is mycorrhizal fungus swells into these kind of bladders within, um, within the plant cells and burst releasing their contents. So here we can actually go inside the root. And so this is where the plant, the plant still has to you know, conduct water and nutrients through itself. So this is where the vascular bundle of the plant is and the fungi are kept out of this zone. So the fungi really are kind of organ of the plant. The plant is actually an organ of the fungus as well. You can think of it like that. as this reciprocal um, intimate dependence, um, but carefully regulated and carefully controlled. Um, it's not just a willy nilly infection of the plant root. Um, very specialized differentiated tissues. And here we go, zooming back out. Wow, um, that is <laughs> like how I, so when I've been um, exploring working with trees, I would sit uh, with trees and then I'd let my imagination roam around inside the tree as a way of, of trying to understand what was going on. And, and I would imagine zooming, going down roots and sort of traveling down and then all of these like sort of almost like you're in a, going to a port and they're sort of shipping and then off you go off these different packets of that stuff mm -hmm. goes to different places. So that's really mind blowing to see that video, which I haven't seen before. We've got a question coming from YouTube that is what does that mean? Does that mean soil was made from algae? So Yes, well, yes, and no. So this soil is made from lots of things, but soil is made up in part from the, the dead and digested, dead and rotted tissues of, of plants um, or lichens. Lichens, in fact, are the source of young soils in new ecosystems that form on bare rock, because lichens are some of the first things to grow on bare rock. So when lichens die and are decomposed, they give rise to young soils. But soils are also formed when um, fungi and these mycorrhizal fungi use acids and high pressure to burrow into solid rock, releasing all sorts of minerals. And so there's a mineralization of rock that gives rise to soil. And there's also, and that's a sort of inor inorganic component. And then you have the organic component, which is the, the dying and decomposition of, of plant material and um, algal material. So, um, so you so yes. thought that it's something like in terms of, is it in terms of the soils up to a third or a quarter are made up of the weight of them made up of mycorrhizal networks? Yeah, so between a third and a, a half of the biomass of soils is mycorrhizal fungal tissue. So this is a substantial sum. Um, and there's a wonderful number that um, in the top 10, 10 centimeters of the soil all over the world, so that globally, um, the length of mycorrhizal fungal hyphae is um, about half the width of the galaxy. So these are these are vast, and that's just the top 10 centimeters of soil. So these are um, vast um, areas. I mean, because every, every length of hypha is of course, a, me a membranous area. And if you unfolded that, then you have all this area, this membrane for absorption and translocation. So there's a lot of contact, a huge amount of contact with the soil, which is one of the reasons why 
these fungi are so helpful for plants because they simply have more contact with the soil because they have so much more surface area. So there's all sorts of things that I know that we wanted to talk about. And I think time-wise, I'm going to have to sort of um, be considerate of some of the other things. I look at sharing your um, book, which <laughs> would be an excellent source of that information. Um, I think, what does that, what do you think that means for our sort of, obviously there's a lot philosophically that it makes one want to sort of feel into in terms of what, what that means for how we perceive ourselves and each other and the, and the earth that we're living on. But what do you think that, um, could you give us some sort of sense of our relationship moving forward with fungi? Yes, so there are lots of possibilities. There's, there's, um, well, there are lots of ways that we can partner with fungi to help adapt to the many crises we find ourselves within. And um, there are many amazing new types of relationship with fungi that are forming between humans and these astonishing organisms. Um, Microremediation is one where we, we harness fungi and their amazing metabolisms to break down and help restore contaminated or degraded landscapes. Um, another one is um, but fungi, are, again, with their amazing, ingenious metabolisms, they're a source of a huge number of medicinal compounds, some of which are powerfully antiviral and have recently been found um, through the work of Paul Stamets to reduce colony collapse disorder in bees, which is obviously a major problem for us, a major problem for the planet, um, and for the biosphere. So there's this whole medicinal angle, and um, in particular with bees, but I just, just I'm sure there are many, many more of these solutions that we just haven't found yet because we haven't looked. So as we look more, I'm sure we'll find more. Another one, which is really uh, in full swing is using fungal mycelium to create building materials or fabrication materials. So this is actually booming. Um, NASA are doing a research project in, interested in using mycotecture as it's called to grow structures on the moon. Um, DARPA, this wing of the American military research um, have given a huge grant to a company to develop fungal um, building materials. Um, there are fungal leathers being made, which you can grow this fungal leather, which is stronger than deer hide. And you can grow it in a week on material that would otherwise be thrown away, a waste material, corn stalks or all the like, agricultural waste. Um, so then you don't need to chop down the forest to make the field to grow the cow. You don't need to feed the cow. I mean, this is huge savings ecologically um, because we're using a waste product to grow a valuable product so it's a win for the waste producer it's a win for the cultivator and it's a win for the fungus um, because we are going out of our way to divert hundreds of tons of waste material into their ready and waiting appetites so myto yeah mycotexture and microfabrication that's one other a very exciting new avenue Thank you very much, Merlin. And um, what I'd like to do is um, give uh, the other speakers, if they would like to ask a question of Merlin, I wonder um, if there's anybody else, if there's anyone else in the, from the speakers who has something that, that, uh, that they would like to ask. My, uh, John Tucker from the Woodland Trust. I'd like to introduce John Tucker from the Woodland Trust who's participated in all of the tree conference live stream um, conference panels um, over the last few years and uh, is the director of woodland creation so that's I mean John is that like 30 years of experience of plant of woodland creation in the UK? <laughs> um, more than that I'm afraid <laughs> it's nearer 40. Um, <laughs> hi Merlin uh, fascinating um, talk I'm really interested in how we can use mycorrhizae mycorrhizal fungi much more to help improve our woodland creation work. So if we're doing sort of um, trying to create woodland on very, you know, relatively impoverished ar arable soils, for example, you know, is there a role for using um, fungi as part of that establishment process to make, you know, the woodland better, quicker? It's a really good question. And I'm afraid it's not a simple, simple one. Um, on the whole, you know, whenever a wood establishes itself, there are going to be fungi involved because they're so fundamental. And the question is, can we, I guess, can we accelerate this process or, or guide it in such a way that it happens more quickly? 
And in principle, yes, it's absolutely something that can be done. In practice right now, it's not so straightforward. A lot of companies sell mycorrhizal inoculum, kind of generic mycorrhizal inoculum. Um, it's a bit like the booming market in human probiotics. You know, these strains that you see in these jars, usually they're kind of dead listers in your gut, but they're sold in jars because they're easy to produce in manufacturing facilities. They're easy to culture. And we've someone sequenced them or sold their genome or their model organism or some, there's a number of convenient reasons why they're chosen rather than because these are the fungi that need to be in this place at this moment in the successionary process. So it's a question I think of um, being sensitive about how we choose to add these species if we do choose to add them. But it also it can be simpler to just to encourage their growth by, by paying attention to the health of the soil. So lots of organic matter generally does mm. good things for mycorrhizal fungi. Um, inorganic fertilizers generally do not so good things for mycorrhizal fungi. So by attending to the health of the soil, I think we can by proxy support the natural regeneration of these fungal communities without necessarily having to import and add with all the difficult decisions and possible um, fallout from those decisions that that would entail. So that, I think that's the simplest way forward. But I think a lot more research needs to be done on, because there's an ecological matching of these communities, these plant communities and fungal communities. And if we don't know that for this place, then we're working blind. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's one of the things that's really exciting about having you on, Merlin, because, you know, I know you're not supposed to sort of ask a woman her age, but like you are a relatively young comer. You've sort of qualified um, from your doctorate, or is it a doctorate or, um, you know, yeah, your doctorate uh, not that long ago. And yet you've kind of burst onto the scene and been able to create a huge shift in people's understanding or or highlight the work of other people as well who have been contributing in this field to a huge shift of understanding of perspective. And it really shows that there's so much out there still to be learned, to be understood about both trees and soils. And, and what a massive invitation that is to the next generation and to people looking to study now, because there's it's all to play for. Mm -hmm. Quite right, yeah, it's a thrilling field. And um, there's just so, so many questions that aren't being asked. Um, so all these low hanging questions, it's a, it's a fun place to do research. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I am a bit of a nerd and I'm going to try and relatively stick on time, even though we started late. I've got a question coming from Daniela Castell. Um, how do you eat the beech leaves, raw or in a salad, Glenny? You have to unmute. <laughs> yeah, I, I eat them straight from the tree while I'm picking them, but then when I bring them home, uh, but they're delicious. They are delicious. Um, not uh, um, and then when I bring them home, I might I might make any salad dressing that um, you want to make. I like to tear them. There's something very satisfying about it. Sounds quite brutal, actually, Glenny. <laughs> Um, is there any other questions any of the speakers would like to ask each other before we move into some some um, sort of finishing statements or uh, something like that? Martha, you're allowed to too if you want to. I, I'm I'm quite fascinated by by um, what what Merlin said uh, in relation to what John said in relation to how we regenerate our forests. You know, we've 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 decimated all our ancient forests, and um, in planting new woodland, how we um, how we almost like fast track what the earth might take hundreds of years to do, in order to create the ecosystems that the the earth already had created. And um, I think planting native trees and planting native plants amongst the planting is also also a way forward. But just a, a quick one for Merlin. Um, ha, would you be able to kind of inoculate the woodland, as it were, with the sort of fungi um, mycorrhiza for the for the fungi to, to come above ground that would normally be there? In, 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 a, in, a, in a normal woodland? Well, I think the fastest way to do this would be to, um, 
these communities are complex and they're not just fungal and they're bacterial and the fungi have bacteria that live inside them. And there's a whole type of bacteria called mycorrhizal helper bacteria, which is like the microbiome of the mycorrhizal fungus, without which they can't form healthy relationships with trees. So we need all of this and we don't understand nearly as much as we should about that. So we're in this, this realm of unknown unknowns um, as well as known unknowns. And so I think the fastest thing to do, just like you might if you were making yogurt or sourdough, to take an entire, you know, a, a spoonful of someone's culture, a thriving, healthy culture made up of all sorts of organisms, and use that as an inoculum. So could we use forest soil from a nearby healthy forest on a similar kind of bedrock, on a similar kind of aspect, you know, try and do the ecological matching as best we can, and uh, making sure that there aren't any diseases. It's a bit like a fecal transplant. You know, this is a huge thing right now in the field of a microbiome studies. Like we don't know what part of that microbiome is doing the good job, but a sample of someone's feces will bring it all over. But to do that, we have to make sure that they're, they're matched, that there aren't any diseases, and et cetera. So I think a similar kind of fecal transplant mentality would be quite a straightforward way to do this and wouldn't depend on years and years of academic research and slow publication cycles. I think this could be done relatively quickly with um, a relatively low budget and uh, you know, get, get this off the ground quite soon arguing by analogy from these other ways that we already use microbes very successfully and have done for a very long time. Thank you. That's a brilliant question, Glennie, and it also makes me notice a comment from um, in the chat from Lynn, Lynn Roots of the Time um, saying that um, for her, that's it, what, when she's listening to you, it just makes her feel more and more um, her passion for rewilding um, as one of the very strong ways of working. Um, so we've had uh, not really enough time to hear from John Tucker. And so I would like to ask John Tucker a couple of questions, if that's all right with everyone. Um, because there's a lot going on for trees in the UK right now, isn't there, John? Um, yep. We've got yep. several um, major planning issues um, with regards to both HS2 and also the Cambridge Oxford development. And I know Woodland Trust have been very active. And I know that there are a lot of people out there who care passionately. So I wondered, if you'd like to just say a little bit about um, how Woodland Trust is looking to move forward with those and, and with other uh, landscape developments. Yeah, just to pick up on what Glennie said about, um, you know, the, the importance and the value of ancient woodland and the phase one of HS2, which got planning permission last year, is going to have a, you know, an impact on 32 um, ancient woodlands. So they're going to be um, impacted on and cleared as part of that, that work. Um, we as an organization have thought that along with a lot of other organizations and individuals, um, but planning permission was granted um, finally last year and phase one enabling works have unfortunately already started. So it's kind of, they've used the lockdown when it's quiet to get started at a really completely the wrong time of year for that work. And we've already had a number of reports from activity going on when it shouldn't be. Um, so, you know, we can only ask people to monitor what's going on, to let us know if they see this happening or to get on to their local MP or to HS2 themselves. Um, the Oxford and Cambridge sort of arc growth area um, is one that's coming up on the horizon. Um, plans for an east-west rail route there are going to impact on woodland. So we're working with a whole range of organizations, wildlife trusts, RSPB, um, to try to present what will be a, you know, a green approach to creating that, that link. Um, but it's early days there. Um, so- How know, many woodlands are affected by that one? Oh, it's really difficult to say at the moment because we're, we're looking, you know, it's very difficult to see good quality maps of the area that's gonna be impacted on. Um, it's just been given in a sort of a, a very generalist view at the moment. Um, but, you know, but it's not, I, those are examples where there are negative impacts. I think um, there, you know, I, I've been in this business for gosh, 40 odd years now. Um, and the last 18 months have probably been the most dynamic that I've known in those 40 years for trees, you know, and it's been fantastic to see. Um, people have said, you know, we've got, you know, even with COVID coming along, 
people have got more time to look around. You know, I'm looking at the trees that I've got in my garden now. Um, I'm seeing trees just down the road that I've never noticed before, you know. So it's not all bad news. Um, and I, I'm really hopeful for the future. Thank you. And I'm also conscious that the Woodland Trust have got an extraordinary um, action plan um, or, pr or proposal that has been incredibly well thought through um, on your website. I wondered if you'd like to just say something a little bit about that and, and about the kind of rates of planting that that looks like that we, I suppose that was just to backtrack from the tree conference perspective, we're always looking at what supports citizen led uh reforestation and what we can do as individuals um and farmers and landowners and all those different things and living in cities so i wonder if you wouldn't mind saying a little bit about that action plan and the grants available uh yes yeah so the um, emergency tree plan was published uh just at the end of last year i suppose the key thing in it is about trying to get some sense behind um you know where we need to be in terms of woodland creation to combat climate change. The Climate Change Committee report last year um, was looking at rates of 30,000 hectares of new woodland being created every year. Um, and the Woodland Trust supports that. That would probably take our tree cover in the UK from about um, 10%, uh, sorry, 13% at the moment up to 19%. So that's something like 1.5 million hectares of new woodland that's needed. Um, but we are, so 30,000 hectares a year in the UK, we are way off that at the moment. I think we did probably around um, 13, 14,000 hectares last year. So we need to double what we're doing across the UK. England, we probably need to be doing around 10,000 hectares a year. We did, what, 1,300 hectares last year. So we need to be doing seven or eight more times than we're doing. I think there's a role for everybody here. You know, if you've got room in your garden, um, you can plant trees. If you if you haven't got a garden, there are local community groups that you can get involved in. Um, landowners, you know, farmers can plant hedges, infield trees, areas for new woodland. So I think there's a role for everybody. Um, if they go onto the Woodland Trust website, there's some great information there about grants, about schemes they can get involved. Um, we have a fantastic free tree scheme for schools and communities um, where you can apply online and get up to 400 trees free for your community. So there's something there for everybody. We've all got a role to play. Thank you. And it also really makes me think in terms of bringing it back to roots is that sense of um, also if we can expand, if we can support uh, a wider area, a wider berth around particularly existing old oaks. Um, quite often there's this situation where people plow right up to the trunk and actually yeah. now with our under deeper understanding of the requirements of trees roots um, and their need for, for to not have excess nitrogens, um, you know, right uh, in their in their root structures and uh, and needing to have, uh, I think the diameter it, the, the radius from the canopy is something like 2.5, an oak will reach out further. Um, we've got a few more questions coming in. There's also lots of um, different projects on the Tree Conference website. And if you have projects, if you know of projects that are going on that you think are really worth highlighting, we'd really love you to get in contact with us through the Tree Conference website um, or info at thetreeconference.com and let us know so that we can put more uh, projects up on the website. So we've got um, a f suddenly a flurry of questions come in um, and uh, I'm going to just take a moment to read them. So, someone's, su someone's suggesting that we should maybe sensibly be putting our poo on the land as a safe word, so which is, which is val valuable and potentially a thing. Um, I'm interested in research on the effect of herbicides and pesticides and mycorrhizal fungi. Can I recommend that you go to the YouTube channel and look at the work of Dr. Martin Bidantontoro? Um, they were lucky to have a European research grant and they were some of the only researchers, scientists in the world who were back to do this research. So he really is one of the most extraordinary scientists to hear. And there is a full hour um, video on the Tree Conference website. Is there a way to combine the practice of rewilding with the planting of new native trees from John? 
Yeah, I, I think that's a really a great question. Um, and, you know, I think we need to be using more natural regeneration, more of the rewilding approach, definitely, but it's not going to work everywhere. So if you look at some of our upland um, landscapes, for example, there are just no seed sources there to kickstart the process. So you would need to start to plant some trees um, just to, as I say, just to start that process. But I always think when you're planting a wood, that's just the start of the process. That's not how it's going to end up. So you want to create a space where nature can then sort of add its dimension to it in terms of birds bringing in other seeds, um, the whole of the fungal development that Merlin's talked about, that can start the process. So yeah, a combination of the two is brilliant. And I suppose a big question, which is also coming from Delia is, if you don't have a garden, um, how do you get a, how do you go about either a source, um, um, sourcing land or or contributing towards um, planting projects uh, on on land? Yeah, so there are um, there are a number of really good community groups that are out there at the moment that are operating. Um, we've been talking with some really interesting projects, Stump Up for Trees and the Brecon Beacons. Um, where they, they aim to plant a million trees um, across you know, the Brecon Beacons area. So they will be talking with local farmers, other landowners to try and create um, areas where they can plant trees and they will need people to help them plant. So those are the sorts of things that you can get involved in. But look around local community groups, um, sports clubs, um, hospitals, they've all got land that we, you know, we could get more trees uh, established on. Thank you very much. Oh, one more from Gilly, and then I'm going to have to. Um, I think we should we should uh, wrap up. And so I just wanted to um, say about Tree Sisters because we can all donate a very small amount of tree to Tree Sisters every month, and uh, the every everything you donate to Tree Sisters goes into planting trees, and it's a very small amount. It's a it's a cup of coffee a week and um, they're doing fantastic work and they've just planted 10, they've just reached 10 million trees planted and that's all from people's donations. So it's, it, and it's a beautiful organization and they give back a lot as well as giving to the earth and the trees. Thank you. And that's it, obviously they're planting in the tropics um, and there are many other communities all over the world that are experiencing some really hard times. So. I think sourcing out those different organisations that are working to plant in a way that is within an ethical relationship with the local communities so that those communities are supported uh, to be involved in the planning and in the long term care of those trees is a very important criteria when you're looking for investing in and supporting tree planting um, globally. Uh, we've been doing quite a lot of work on that through the, a network of different organisations involved. Um, there are some, a lot of those are represented in the partnership side, which we'll show up again, and also um, I would name check Trees for the Future, um, and I'm going to actually, and, and there's a whole load, there's so many that I don't know if my brain can quite cope with saying it now, but we will be doing a newsletter after the um, live stream, and we can include information about anything that anyone's interested in in that newsletter. So if you sign up to the newsletter on the Tree Conference website, then that's one way of taking those um, deeper research forward. And I, and I really do encourage people to do the research because actually that's what means that we get to um, build these communities and, and, and learn how to make the decisions that really support trees as well. Um, I want to mention a few different things. I want to mention the Listening to the Earth group have got a meditation. Um, so the Listening to the Earth group sit with organizations that like uh, the UN and they support global meditations and focus into uh, big UN events, climate change discussions and uh, global events of all sorts. And they are now bringing out a, um, they've got a meditation on Sundays. I think it's at 9 p.m., um, 8 p.m. UK time, 9 p.m. European time. You can read that on their Facebook and also on our partnership page to let you know a little bit more about that. Tree Sisters has got a Courage to Shine course at the moment, which gives you an opportunity to uh, do the personal development work uh, to how, what, you know, what are your blocks to connecting to the earth? What, 
what is coming through your body and how can you support the development and understanding of your place at the moment and that course is um running uh it, yeah i think it's possible to sign up for that course now um permaculture magazine have got an ex uh a permaculture competition i think the closing is in august but that will mean that um if you if you are getting really involved in permaculture then you can enter what you're doing for that um, for that competition and you can read more about that on the permaculture magazine website if you have kids which i do then plant the future has got a very cool make a rainforest in a box where you can where the kids can make the rainforest they've got really good resources and it means also that you're labeling the different forest levels so we had a go at that that's my daughter's daisies i'll show you another one here this is zoe's who came and did it there we go with all the with the forest floor and then the, the understory planting and the canopy in the upper story it's amazing the, um the emergent layer obviously there's uh, lots of fun things to be done from uh, using up recycling and carbon. There's my other daughter's, she made a um, fairground. Uh, so, you know, there's uh, all sorts of options. We have a um, per illustration that we'd like for if anybody wants to color in, which we'll make available on the website. And so anybody who wants to have a go at coloring in, that can be grown ups as well as children. And then you can send in your copies. Um, to us at info at the treeconference.com and then uh, in a month's time we're going to be doing another live uh, broadcast and then maybe we can show some of those um, those colorings in or painting um, and then we've also got um, International Tree Foundation are doing a lovely uh, competition around your favorite tree and um, Kindred Spirit when we show up the logos we didn't unfortunately put Kindred Spirit in so really recommend them as a mind body spirit organization i'm sure there's things that i haven't mentioned and so if everybody was would be up for signing up in the chat then we can um uh, signing up in the to the newsletter then we can make sure that we i you know all the things i've undoubtedly forgotten can be involved we can let people know some of those links and i really encourage people to look at the website and uh, and to explore the website of all of our partners as well because they're there not because um you know we're trying to uh, get money or anything like that it's very much because they've been handpicked because they've been doing really excellent work in their own right in all of in 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 every single case um so uh there's a lot of uh stuff to be exploring and we are now i think Ma martha if that's okay with you gonna go over to martha tilston who is an amazing folk player she, singer she's been doing um excellent live streams uh, which she did one of last night and marthatilston.co.uk is her website and uh, Martha I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you so much just want to say um, that was um, just really inspiring and deep and uh, my mind is bubbling. Um, I've been I'm going to go and pick some beech leaves and eat them today as <laughs> well. I'm just, uh, I'm really enjoying connecting with trees at the moment and um, remembering it's a good world. It's a beautiful world. It's the best planet we know of at the moment for us and uh, everything we need is here. Thank you, Susie. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for letting me be part of this. Everybody's saying that there's no hope on earth. We should build a spaceship and perform the next rebirth. Blast away into the blackness in search of carbon worth. Just one leaf of what we have here. Yeah, we got it all here. Everything we need is here. We have it all here. But everybody's saying time is running low So I'll meet you in the supermarket, panic by And then down below into our bunkers like rats in a cave no, I'm gonna stand in the middle of the forest I want to feel brave, yeah I need to feel brave This is something we can save, I need really save this is a good world. It's a good, 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 good world. Oh, I think it's
it's a fine world. It's a fine, 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 fine world. And nothing maybe if we sing this over and over again now. Like a mantra, it will manifest somehow. So it's a good world, yeah, it's a good world, it's a good world, yeah, it's a good world. Everybody's saying time is running out. We should build a time machine and clone ourselves when we run out of the perfect people. By the way, that's not you or me in any way. I disagree. I disagree. This is something we could say. This is something we could say for me. Really say. Because this is a good world. It's a good, 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 good world. I can hear my kids jumping around upstairs. This is a fine world. It's their future too. This is a good world. It's a good, 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 good world. And please remember this in amongst all the maps. Such a fine world. It's a fine, 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 fine world. Thank you so much. Oh, and I'm just going to let the applause be like all the kind of trees going, yay, Martha. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you for mentioning your children, because if I had one prayer or intention for this call, it would be for us to be really looking at the pathways that are those that are going to support the future generations and remembering that a lot of us have so much uh, wisdom that we've been accruing through exploring about trees and making loads of mistakes. And um, our intention for, these for this call and for all future calls is to be really supporting the next generation and those youth and those scientists and those next generation of planners and architects and everything um, that we can be putting the earth and the earth community at the center of every single decision and system in such a way as to have a fine good way forward um so thank you very much i i'm sure there's lots of things i haven't said or remembered but i'd like to say now thank you very much to the whole team and crew of everybody who have been putting this together all of the different people watching and all of the things that have meant that you've been able to watch and um we're gonna i think put the logo slide up but maybe if martha if you wouldn't mind just playing us out while we generally have the logo and just did sort of tap down. <laughs> but, I do the breathing, but I do the meditation for for us through this time in the trees again. Is that all right? Yeah, and um, and, and we, what we might do is um, we might start at, in a moment <laughs> when it feels right to Dobby. We might put the partner slide up because I just it really might. I really it matters to me that people see those different organisations. So maybe Dobby, you could sort of get the right time for you um, when after Martha started. Okay. Mm -hmm. Breathe in and breathe out Close your eyes And breathe I go to a stream In my mind a clear flowing stream It winds through the trees all mossy and green We are but a moment in all that they see Summer will come again and with it memories of happier times we must gather them in but please remember to let new ones begin. So 
maybe what they say is true we're only send the challenges we can grow through i don't know all contemplation in isolation we are connected Thank you, Martha. Bye-bye, everyone.